If you want to know what's the easiest way to sabotage your patient outcomes, you have to tune into this episode. Uh, this episode. Uh, before I go on to the podcast, what is new? What is better in life? Uh, I just came off of, I'm on a high at the moment. I just came back from a um, like leadership development, personal development um, conference on the East Coast and at the same time, uh, my wife, I, I was gone for a couple of days. I come back that next day, my wife flies out to Ohio for a um, family funeral. And it has been fun <laughs> to navigate all of this uh, while uh, trying to make sure that my three kids are loved and safe and, uh, you know, they feel good. And so it's been uh, quite the whirlwind over the last week. Uh, but I'm, I'm back to it, uh, back on. I, I, if you're listening to this, is 2023, May of 2023. Uh, right back at it into meetings and developing my team and uh, making sure that um, everyone is successful, uh, truly enjoying what they do and that they're successful at it. That is really my passion. So um, that is what's new. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, my daughter uh, might be getting into jujitsu. Uh, that's the current thing right now. My son is, and uh, she watched my son uh, in the class and she's like, I could do that. <laughs> so I love that. It's my daughter's personality. She sees it and she's like, I'm going to attack that thing. And so uh, the qualifier on this, uh, I think that uh, she should not be allowed to uh, go against my older son because I think he would just have too much fun uh, with that. So uh, Jacob is doing great. Uh, my wife's doing great. Uh, just back on it. So all right, on to this podcast. What is new? What's better with, uh, with uh, physical therapy? What's new in the sports world? And why are we talking about patient outcomes and sabotaging, right? Our profession, we're all about, uh, you know, obviously helping people move better, live better, you know, whatever the slogans are nowadays. But ultimately, you're about improving the quality of life. That's really what it comes down to. Um, if you guys have heard my podcast in the past, I am not against the whole movement process uh, because I was <laughs> I was raised by a movement queen uh, and that's Shirley Sarman but I think um, if you look at the highest level of like how we help people um, I think you have to kind of separate that between other professions and I think that's why it all got started so movement's quite a, really really good um, but you know, when you're working with post-ops, you're working with athletes at a certain point, you're in season movement is less of a priority and it's all about improving their quality of life. And so, um, you know, when you look at that's our goal and focus, have you ever thought what you're doing could actually hinder or do the opposite of what you're trying to do? And that's what I'm going to bring some light today. There's a lot of sports physical therapists who don't realize this is happening and they're literally sabotaging their patient outcomes. And it happens every day uh, inside your clinic and even to you. Um, and the, the biggest thing I can tell you right now is honestly, just listen, absorb, and put into practice what you need to be aware of and so that way you can avoid it and not set your patients and your athletes up uh, for failure. And that's really what it comes down to. And I'm very passionate about this. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because um, for those who don't know, I have my strength and conditioning summit coming up uh, next month in June, June 10th. And um, as I prepare and I look at research, and I look at all these other factors, I have generally like wherever your attention goes, your energy flows. So as I pay more attention to that, I have more discussions with people about like how they're programming. I just talk to the strength coach. I talk to my team. Like, what are you guys doing? How are you guys doing your programming? And as I see those things, I'm like, oh, we're definitely doing things right. And on some things we can be doing it better. And one of the conversations uh, came about, well, um, well, how soon do you add in strength conditioning? What are you doing with these numbers? And um, the simplicity of one of the answers was do less, not more. And for some people, that's hard, especially physical therapists, right? We're like super passionate, uh, empathetic uh, people who want to just literally like make a huge difference in people's lives as we think like more is better. So um, one of the answers that I gave on a scenario of, you know, uh, what they should be doing in season with programming, I said, actually, what you're doing right now is too much. I would do less. I would do, I would do significantly less and drop this, move these things over, and I'll share that with you. But ultimately, it comes down to how many patients are you seeing right now that you can ultimately do more by doing less? And that's what we'll talk about today. So um, it comes off conversations about strength conditioning. 
and how I truly believe uh, you can do, you can increase your outcomes by doing less. And I think that you're doing too much. Let me explain. So the first part is imagine um, a an athlete who is, um, let me let me give an example of a pro athlete schedule, right? And the pros, you're going to have an athlete who trains, honestly, six days a week, seventh day is absolute rest, six days a week. Um, one of those is competition. Let's assume it's a Saturday. So Monday through Friday is training. Friday is a shakeout, meaning they're only doing like prep work. They're not really doing any form of high load. Uh, it's just practice drills, running through it. So that only leaves Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So you only actually have four days of work while you're in season. Um, and maybe the heaviest day would be Tuesday or Wednesday. And Monday is kind of recouping from the previous competition. You review kind of what you did well. Uh, you're still uh, doing some movement, a little bit of light load. Tuesday, you can go a little heavier because you have multiple days to rest. Wednesday is, um, you know, technique work and uh, everything that you need to do. And Thursday is a lighter practice and you go right into the week. So they already have four days of act or five days of activity, one day of competition, one day of rest. And in that, they'll have splits where they'll do a morning session and evening session. In the morning, they'll have like a normal um, training session, maybe it's soccer or baseball, whatever it is. In the evening, they'll do a weight training session. And that's very light, a little bit of load. Um, and that allows them to be able to be successful in their their career. And somewhere in there, they have to have recovery, right, to be able to like refill that cup of physical stress. And if you really think about it, our entire profession is built on one thing, pain. And if people don't have pain, it's very difficult for us to have a job, <laughs> if you really think about it. So what you end up doing is um, we try and manage pain. And if you really think about how pain come of, comes about, pain is just an accumulation of stress over time. And our job is to help alleviate that pain. But instead of going towards physical stress, we try and manage mechanics that are improper or poor impairments that could be leading to added stress. But the interesting part is we don't monitor or manage the overall stress being applied to the body. We try and manage the mechanic or the impairment that leads to added stress. So even if we ran a perfect impairment, a perfect movement, if there's still overloaded stress to that area, you're still going to have pain. So if we know pain is an accumulation of stress over time that leads to pain, the best way to attack pain is by looking at the overall stress in addition to the like impairment that leads to more stress. And if you can process that, that your job is to look at where is the stress coming from that's leading to pain. And if you can process that, where does added stress come from? Not just the knee valgus. Well, what stress are they being applied to or what is stress is being applied throughout their day or week? So then now you have to go like, well, wait a minute, this knee valgus Everybody has a little bit of knee valgus. Why does this person have knee pain? Well, it's because they run five days a week and they don't take recovery days and they don't stretch or whatever your philosophy is. Okay, so now if we're on the same page that pain is a result of added stress over time, then manage the stress. So look at their weekly stress volume. Well, what is that? Well, I don't know. Most physical therapists won't even ask that question. Well, how many days did they run? Uh, I think they said three. In what shoes? Oh, I know exactly what shoes they are. Okay, what terrain? How long did they prep for this? How long have they been running? What's the intensity? What's the RPE? How much recovery time? Is it a fartlek run? Is it long, like slow endurance runs? Well, I don't know. I didn't ask. I just asked that they run. Well, you're failing to understand where the stress is being applied over time. You're just looking at the impairment to look at where the problem is. How about you manage the stress <laughs> The overall stress that has been applied to this knee for weeks to months that has not been solved. When you magically think 
that this knee pain is going to get rid of it because of one great mechanical change that you make. Now, when they're in season, the problem is they already have a lot of stress being applied to their week, to their day. So how do you reduce pain? That's an art. They're in season. They can't stop practice. They can't avoid competing. So how do you solve this? Well, what's their total weekly stress amount? What can you reduce? And what are you going to add? What it comes down to is it's just a scale. How much stress are you applying and how much you're removing? And every single case scenario is going to be a challenge. We can give all the examples you want. You have a post-op nine months out. You have a atraumatic insidious onset low back pain. You have a soccer player with a uh, MCL sprain six weeks ago. If they're in season, all you can do is look at the stress applied over a week, over a month, and help figure out where can you reduce stress and where are you going to add it. And what I mean by adding is, you'd be like, well, physical therapists don't add stress. Yes, you do. It's called exercise. It's called resistance. It's called progressive resistive exercise. So if you're, if you're working with an athlete and you're adding physical stress, you have to understand if you have somebody who's overloaded with stress across a week, across a month, and they're injured, and now you're like, well, I have a solution. Let's just add more physical stress, and that will solve your problem. But we don't think of it in that terms. We're like, oh, this impairment is the thing that's causing it. So let's not talk about your physical stress that's been across a week. Let's talk about the one magical exercise or impairment that we're going to fix, and we're going to add more stress to you. And somehow that's going to reduce your pain. The math just doesn't work. And as a sports physical therapist, think about this. PT school and clinical practice has always told you, you have to add more physical stress in order for people to get better. Everything, every premise underneath everything that we do Soft tissue mobilization, manual therapy, that's like physical stress being applied. Everything that you're taught, clamshells, bridges, single leg RDLs, like, okay, now if they're in neuromuscular control with not a lot of load, I get it, different purpose. The minute you start adding more weight, more volume, more intensity, you're adding physical stress. Now that might work for most people, but now when you're talking about an athlete, it's a different world because they have physical stress across a week that they have to participate in. And this is where most physical therapists sabotage their patient outcomes. They don't consider this. And it's a real deal. And the reason why I say this is because the more physical therapists that I mentor, the more I understand it's not your fault. It's, that it's our training, it's our system, it's everything that we've been lined up on how to manage people. We add more physical stress. But when you have somebody who's in season and already has a lot of stress, you can't do that. We will say, well, Chris, what do I do? The role here is not to add more stress. You can add more stress, but that means you've got to reduce stress somewhere. And that's the big thing I have to have you understand. So what's the, the easiest way to, to uh, sabotage a patient outcome? You add more volume. You add more physical stress. You add more volume of things on their plate. Volume is the biggest problem in physical therapy and managing athletes. Volume, volume, volume. It's the thing that we love to give out, but we don't control or even think of monitoring. Well, if I'm going to throw more volume, what if they're already doing a lot of volume in practice? Well, I didn't think about that. What are you going to do? I don't know. That's where most people get stuck. Now what do I do? Great, I know volume's a problem. What do I do? What I need you to understand is adding more volume of exercises adds to more mechanical or physical stress. This ultimately doesn't contribute to rehabilitation. It actually increases the risk of injury or re-injury. It's counterproductive. That's the irony of this whole thing. <laughs> An athlete goes to a physical therapist because they want to feel better. And a physical therapist adds more volume and stress during a high volume and high stress time in their career. 
in season. And they wonder why they can't get better. Oh, it's just, it's because it's in season. They just had to, they had to grind it out. You know, it's not my fault. They didn't do their home exercises or they did them. It just didn't work. You were throwing more volume on volume. And that's a problem. Um, your your ultimate goal is obviously to reduce their pain. But if you're doing this, you're actually contributing to re-injury and it's counterproductive to everything that you stand for. And I told you it's normal for more, most physical therapists to do this. It's absolutely normal, right? Uh, the way we're kind of brought up and instructed is what, you know, we have to apply things to change things. And so that's that's normal for about 20% of the circumstances. If you have somebody who's yeah, and and for this kind of goes back to my physical stress bell curve. It, uh, in the middle of the bell curve is most most human beings. They're active. They want to stay active. Then there's the left ten percent where you know couch potatoes. They don't want to. They want to move. The the top ten percent is your uh, elite athletes. They already move too much. You got to reduce how much they do. And your couch potatoes. They just need to like move more. So if you're in your clinical practice and you work in an outpatient ortho clinic where you don't get a lot of active people, of course what you're doing works. You're just adding more volume onto them because they don't do enough. So your job has always been, let's just add more volume. Let's get them more active. Oh, perfect. Absolutely. Now, probably 80% of physical therapists practice with that mindset because that's the the patient they see, that's the demographic, that's the type of athlete that they see, the person who just doesn't move enough. So that strategy or that approach just makes sense. Let's just add more volume, add, get them to do more. Well, the problem becomes when you start applying that to active people or very active people like athletes who are in season, who you're not used to seeing, and you're like, magically, let me apply same couch potato approach to an elite athlete who happens to train a lot. What happens? You're like, oh, I just, I'm, I, I'm normally a good therapist. I'm, I'm not sure what's happening. The person changed, and you didn't change your approach to them. So, as a physical therapist, you have to understand at some point it's you. You are the problem. The reason why people don't get better is because you're clearly not seeing something. And my job is just to tell you and show you. It's not that the patient didn't get better. It's that you try to apply the same principle to two different people who are different, who have different needs from a musculoskeletal standpoint. One is under, underneath the activity curve, and they just need to be more active. Another one is too active, and you have to back them down. So your, your, your method of adding 27 corrective exercises is not going to work with an elite athlete. So with somebody who's very active, you have to learn how to control their volume. And the volume is a big thing on how to change your approach when you have an initial evaluation. You're like, Chris, what do I do now? Find out what their volume is. Figure out what their weekly, monthly, and annual volume is. And there's some simple approaches. Let me, let me share. So one of the first things you can do when you're an when you're in initial evaluation, and they're telling you your story. The first thing you jump to is, where is it located? How much pain? With what type of activity? How, what have you tried? What has worked? What has not? Like you get you all those all sorts of things. I want you to remember this acronym to make it very easy on yourself. FIT, the two T's, FIT. Frequency, intensity, time, and type. FIT, frequency, intensity, time, and type. And when you can understand, you're going to ask them questions about all four of those letters. Frequency, how often do you exercise? Intensity, how fast or heavy do you lift weights or run? What's the amount of time that you spend during those training sessions? And what type of training do you do? If you can answer those four things, or if they can answer those four things, you can gather that information. You have enough to understand what their volume is. And you say, whoa, I didn't know you were training four days a week with very heavy loads. That might be a problem. Even if you have a competition in two weeks, I have to be able to pull something back in order for me to add more volume to you. 
And that will help set the stage for a beautiful relationship because now you're forced to ask, wait a minute, if last week was four, four times a week, what are you doing next week? Right? It just stimulates a really good relationship with that patient and athlete to understand you have to get to know who that athlete is and understand what their volume is for their given time. And it's more than likely that they're in season. You know, people don't come to see us in their off season. Why? Because they don't have enough volume. It's not enough urgency. So everybody that you see who's who's active or an athlete, they're probably seeing you in season. Why? Because pain rarely accumulates with off season type type of training. It's slow. It's tempo. It's less um, less intense. So they have less injury in the off seasons. Athletes generate or develop pain in the preseason or in season. Why? Because everything starts to change. And ultimately, the fail where you fail to understand is what their weekly schedule looks like and how you have to change your approach from the couch potato or the people you saw before and adding that in. You have to change that, or else you're actually doing worse for the athletes. And I hope some of you are just, you're listening. You're like, wait a minute, maybe I have done that in the past. And that's true. I've done it. We've all done it. The whole goal is learn from it as fast as possible. And as soon as tomorrow, ask that those questions about frequency, intensity, time, and type. And you won't go wrong. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to list, you're going to list all that stuff. And you're like, well, now what do I do? It doesn't matter. You started the conversation. You've already approached the athlete in a different manner and you'll be set up for success. Why? Because they're going to naturally ask more questions. Well, what should I do? And even if you don't have the answers, it doesn't matter. You now are getting your brain to think a different way. So that way you can now improve outcomes just a little faster or hit targets or hit things that you weren't even thinking about before. Now, people usually get frustrated. They're like, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know what to do. That's a beautiful art. You have a new problem. I've said this before. Every new level is a different devil. So now when you start asking the frequency, intensity, time, and type question, you're like, well, I, I don't know how many times should you practice now that you have this pain? It gets you your brain in a different space and outside of the normal, how many degrees, how many, you know, range, what's your range, your pain range on this scale, blah, blah, blah. It's the same thing you've been doing all the time. It's just not working. It's just the same stuff over and over. There's got to be more to PT. And it's not just about RPE or numbers. It's about how you can push and pull and create change without relying on exercise of your hands. And one of the best things you can do is understand how to look at somebody's weekly schedule or monthly schedule and make adjustments and then come back. They come back saying, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. Even though you never even touched them, you didn't even have to mobilize them, you didn't have to stretch them. Just by adjusting all the physical stress that's being applied to them a week, you learn how to push and pull. Guess what? You already improve outcomes dramatically. They don't have to rely on that one hour with you to do all the work for them. And that's facilitating, facilitating true independence of what we do as a profession. And if you can understand that, your outcomes will significantly improve. improve. Where did I get this from? Working in the pros, uh, ultimately... I got very frustrated. I felt like I was throwing more at them and they were getting worse. And that's a horrible feeling as a physical therapist. We're trained like the more you give, the more you do, your outcomes should be better. And then I realized as people got better, it's because I pulled back. I gave them less. I just adjusted more. I adjusted their, their parameters. I adjusted their training uh, time. I adjusted their training practice. I removed things. And once I understood, it wasn't the magic of the exercise or the magic of the mobilization or the magic of the blah, blah, blah. It was the magic of understanding how much stress they undergo and how by just changing a few variables, they have less stress across a week. And that's what leads to pain, not just an impairment. An impairment has probably been there for a long time. It was just their added stress over time plus the impairment, which got them worse. But if you just change the impairment, it's a short-term outcome, very, very small. And it's probably going to be short-lived. So one of the first things, uh, ask about the frequency, intensity, and type. Determine from there, what can you take away so you can add more things in? What can you reduce? How many times do they have to practice? Do they really have to go on that one-mile run? Can you reduce the one-mile run to a quarter of a run? Can you reduce the training time from two hours to one hour? What are the things that you can start to adjust so that way you can throw corrective exercises that actually contribute to uh, you know, reducing mechanical stress.
And that's a big piece. Once you've asked the question, you determine where you can add and subtract physical stress, you're in a great, great place. And once you do all that, the next step is inspect. You now start looking at every week, how much better were you from the last week? What is your perceived exertion across this week? How, how fatigued are you? Have you? What's your sleep been like? Are you under-recovered because you were overtraining last week or last month? We've been able to adjust that. They're like, oh, my knee's still hurting. However, I am sleeping better. Uh, overall, my body feels great. It's still a little achy, 40% better. Like, oh, I'm actually hitting big targets. Now I'm actually making huge change in a person's athletic performance, their daily performance, and their perception of their improvement. A lot of people don't get better because they don't see progress. And in their head, they're like, I'm stuck. I'm not going anywhere. This is never going to work. And all you have to do, the magic in getting people better is incremental improvement and pointing them in the direction of showing them 20% two weeks ago, 30% last week, you're 44% this week, you're on the right track. They can see that versus what's your pain scale three weeks ago? Four. What's your pain scale this last week? Four. What's your pain scale this week? 3.5. They can't see that. But they're but what you're failing to do is understand you've controlled the added variables. Ask them how they're able to do and practice. How do you feel with that? What's your RPE with your training? What's your RP in the weight room? They're like, oh, I'm moving better, but it still hurts. It's okay. We're making progress. You're removing the stress over time. And when you combine the two, you're in a really good place. Now you have the manual work, taping, uh, exercise, whatever your philosophy is, and you're removing the other variables. You're changing the impairment at the local level, and you're changing the mechanical stress at the global level. That's success as a sports, uh, sports PT. So number one, ask about the fit principle. Number two, uh, determine where you can add and subtract, subtract physical stress. Number three, weekly reevaluations of progress based on RPE, pain, progress, whatever you want to do. And then number four, long-term. If you are good at this and you can get somebody out of pain, you're, my vision for all of you sports PTs in this country, in this world, on this planet, where we can help people the most is not pain management. Like, I want to get away from that. There's a lot of people who are on the same mission and vision and who want to have an impact uh, to athletes on a massive level. It's not on pain. It's on managing programming to determine their peaks and their valleys throughout the season and predicting and forecasting when they're going to get hurt. Not pain management. Pain management is your waiting and hoping that they get hurt. Who wants that job? Yet PTs pride themselves on it. Why do we want to get be the ones who get dig people out of a hole on a very short timeline and barely get them back to play? How about the biggest bang for your buck is you understand their strength and conditioning program and forecast, oof, right before that week, it's going to be too much. Working with the strength coach, working with the running coach, working with the soccer coach and saying, hey, this is too much leading up to competition. I would back them off, give them a deload week, three weeks out so they can peek at that event. Coach is like, actually, that makes sense. We've had a lot of hamstring injuries right around that time. Yeah, let's let's implement that. And you track that over time because you can look what their physical stress is across three months. When you can do that, guess what? You now have a huge impact on not one knee, 15 knees on that soccer team. That's where you can have a huge impact. Not by one knee and one knee and one knee and one knee. And that's great. I think it's very fulfilling. But what I'm saying is, as a profession, we understand mechanical movement, musculoskeletal system. We can program. We understand injury prevention. We understand wellness. How about you then learn how to use it? Because right now, we're all pain specialists. But what if you can help people at a large scale without even touching pain? Oh, now we're talking. Some of you just fired up right now. <laughs> it's my vision. It's it's everything that I think that sports PTs can do. I think, yeah, great. I think we can manage pain and you can be a magician all you want. But I think where we're going to help this planet is by helping athletes and active people being able to look at their week, their month and train smarter 
uh, with less risk of injury and less risk of re-injury, that's where I think we can help the most. We'll always be pain problem solvers. Uh, but if you're really looking at solutions to reduce the risk of uh, injury happening, which I think that every company or uh, organization, if they can predict, uh, they'd be doing that now. And uh, the problem is we're it's looking at us and we're not looking at it. One of the best things you can do is just sh shift your mindset and how you approach people and managing pain and understanding pain is a mechanical stress applied over time. You got to hit the global scale and the local scale, the local level of that knee valgus. That's great. But how do you prevent it from coming back? That's about programming. It's about strength conditioning, understanding what a training schedule looks like. That's my vision. That's my passion. And if you're a sports PT, you're like, man, that seems next level for me. Because right now, you know, whether you're a new grad or established or whatever it is, you've been managing pain. You, you, like it becomes easy over time to be able to manage pain. It's like, okay, what what can I be doing at a larger level? And that's really understanding strength and conditioning. And that's why I made my strength conditioning summit. Uh, as a clinician, my passion is being able to get athletes better. But now it's helping physical therapists truly understand that they can get them better without even having to like look at the mobilization or the stretch or whatever it is. It's I'm telling you, you can forecast people's pain based on their training volume and training schedule. And if they have pre-existing stuff coming into the season, you're like, oof, that's not going to be good. Coach, you know, they have an ankle sprain right now. I'm forecasting in 10 weeks. If we can't rehab this, they're going to be having trouble here. You might want to, are they going to sit out for the first game? You want to peak them at a second game? You can start to forecast. And that's where really where it comes down to. So uh, if <laughs> this getting you fired up and you're like, I love every aspect of it, come join me with uh, at my strength conditioning summit. Uh, it's a virtual virtual course wherever you are, uh, United States, world, whatever, Canada, uh, Australia, wherever you are, uh, come join me. It's uh, June 10th to uh, June 10th and 11th of 2023, whenever you're listening to this. Uh, it's virtual. Uh, if you are in San Diego, um, I'm only giving a couple seats uh, in person, but the majority are going to be uh, uh, virtual. Um, I think we have four or five states already registered. So I think we just had uh, someone from uh, Massachusetts. So I'm excited to have you in there as well. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, if you're looking to grow your strength and conditioning kind of background so that you can not just get people out of pain, but into performance, or you're trying to manage your pain and you're looking at what am I missing, or I don't even know where to start. <laughs> All of those are going to be perfect for you to attend. It's two days uh, and it'll give you a really good framework to be able to manage your athletes and not just looking at exercises and manual treatment and everything else that um, has worked or has not uh, up to now. So excited to see you then. Uh, nonetheless, I hope you are absolutely crushing everything in your profession. Just remember, ask those simple things. It'll put you onto the next level for yourself and figure out the next problems that come right behind that. And um, I'll tell you what, you start doing this, you're like, okay, Chris, I did that. They did this. I still couldn't do it. It's like just next level stuff and it'll put you on a different path. To what you're doing to your uh, career. So I hope that helps. Uh, nonetheless, I will see you guys on the next episode. Take care, guys.